guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show. We give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is Mark Ellis. Welcome one and all to the best movie news show in the entire galaxy, live from our studios here in San Dimas, California. My name is Mark, <laughs> and on today's show, the Millennium Falcon cockpit got a little lighter, dolls come to life, and the world of shoe cobbling just got a little more competitive. Competitive. Ashley, who's joining me today? Also, here is Ken Napsock. I got your hot takes. I got hot takes <laughs> up the yin yang. <laughs> <laughs> also, here, Jeremy Johns. Got nothing to say except I love Ken's shirt. Ken is just uh, repping the world the way the world needs <clears throat> to be repped. It's right there, it is. You got to love a shirt that combines Han Solo and Bon Jovi. Also here, oh. John Roca. Hey, everyone. How's it going? Listen, I'm available to direct a movie that may have just lost its directors. I know Han Solo. Let's make it happen. <laughs> and look, guys, before we get into the first news story today, there is some breaking news that we should report here, and that is that I popped my cherry last night at Universal <laughs> Studios, and I got to meet a celebrity. Roll the pick. Look what? at that guy. <laughs> look at that. I met a real <laughs> wizard at Universal <laughs> Studios last night. <laughs> I will tell you guys this. When you go to this is it's not the outlaw you're meeting. It's not John Roca. It is a real life wizard or train conductor, whatever the hell they call you Both. guys at Harry Potter Land. Both. And you were fantastic, my friend. Oh, thank you, Mark. It you, was nice to see you. He stayed in character the whole time. I introduced <laughs> yeah. myself as Mark, but they call me baby carrots and he did not break. Nope. <laughs> he was he was a professional through and through. Let's see if that continues for the next 45 <laughs> minutes. Ashley, what's our first major news story? All right. Yesterday, Lucasfilm announced that young Han Solo directors Phil Lord and Christopher Miller exited the movie over creative differences, with both Lucasfilm and <laughs> Lord and Miller releasing statements about the split. The bombshell announcement became even more troubling when Variety later reported that Lord and Miller were actually fired from the production. This is not a laughing matter, <laughs> yeah. actually. I'm sorry, I have to tell you guys that Christian stole my computer and oh, no. wrote a bunch of other things in the notes, so <laughs> well, he's it's a board going dad. to be a very funny show. <laughs> Well, after months of conflict with producer Kathleen Kennedy, others from her Lucasfilm team and co-writer and executive producer Lawrence Kasdan, all of which reportedly clashed with the style and vision of Lord and Miller. Now THR is reporting that the short list of directors Lucasfilm is looking at to take the reins of the troubled production include Ron Howard, Joe Johnston, and even Lawrence Kasdan himself. Mark, thoughts on Lord and Miller's exit from the young Han Solo movie? Oh boy, actually, that is one thing I have no shortage of. There's a lot of unboxing that goes with this story. And as Star Wars fans, there's a lot of emotional unpacking that we need to do. First of all, to sort out what exactly happened, because you figure the production like a Star Wars movie and the team at Lucasfilm, you have everything set to go and you have everybody in total agreement as to what the focus and what the storyline and what the tone of a project is going to be. So you bring in these big name directors like Lord and Miller who did not need this job to make their name in Hollywood. They were already a hot property. So they come in to do Han Solo and you hear that there's been conflict since almost day one now, and that they've been disagreeing with the team at Lucasfilm, with Lawrence Kasdan and his son, who've been writing the script. This makes me nervous for a lot of reasons, not the least of which, they've been shooting this movie since earlier this year, in as far back as January is when they started principal photography. So this has been going on a while, and they decided to just try to play through it and say, oh, okay, we're, we're going to go down this road, and we'll eventually lock on the tone. And now it comes to pass that with only a couple weeks left with principal photography, now we have to jettison directors and bring on somebody new. And that person remains to be seen who they're going to choose. The biggest question I have right now is not who do you bring in, because we can worry about that later. It's what was the genesis of this conflict that led to the firing, which is now being reported the firing of Lord and Miller from the Han Solo project. I have to think it boils down to some of the reports that I've seen where their tone of what Han Solo's comedic take was is very different than what Lucasfilm wanted. And to that, I'd say, as much as I love Lord and Miller and that I agree that they don't need this project, they can go do anything they want. I love the Lego movie. I'm big fans of those guys. You do not second guess Lawrence Kasdan because Lawrence Kasdan is the guy writing the script along with his son, John. He 
knows Han Solo better than Harrison Ford knows Han Solo. He knows how to write dialogue for this guy. So if you have conflict with him, I think you have to be deferential. Now, directors don't want to hear they need to be deferential to anybody, whether it's a studio or it's a writer. But in this particular case, this guy's been writing Han Solo a long time. And one of the many great things about The Force Awakens, in my opinion, is that that's exactly the Han Solo that we were hoping to see. And a lot of that is due to Lawrence Kasdan. So, Ken, I'm going to start with you. First of all, just on a scale of 1 to 10, how surprised or shocked were you by this news? Sc- surprised? 10. Worried? 2. <laughs> wow. <clears throat> um, we're not in these meetings, and, and we all agree to that. We know a lot of people even out there with us, they, they think you know what goes on behind the scenes. You don't, we're not in those meetings. I was at Universal Studios last yeah. night. No yeah. clue. <laughs> And by the way, are we going to not, 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 not acknowledge the elephant in the room, which is your cargo shorts in public? <laughs> um, I need pockets, man. I need pockets. You know, right. I couldn't break, I, and I couldn't break character to say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You what, are those? what are those you're wearing there, son? Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> These shorts are of the dead. Man. Yeah, we don't wear um, those things here, sir. But anyways, um, so surprised. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, our buddy Chris Taylor from the, the author of How Star Wars Conquered the Galaxy is going to have a great book to write about the making of Force Awakens, making of Rogue One, and the making of this movie. Right. There's been reported problems on all of them or reported concerns. But guess what? That's filmmaking. But what concerns me about this are not concerns. They're going to be fine. We all know that. Lucasfilm's going to be fine. And your thought about casting, he's an old school guy. This is the guy who fought George Lucas. I think Han should die. Um, <laughs> and, and I think that's what might have happened here. I can totally see Larry Kasdan going, that's not Han Solo. And them going, no, no, we love Han. And you know what? Their vision might have been right, but Larry's might have been right. But guess what? Power is power, as Cersei Lannister warns us. So if you're in that position, and I'm sure at some point it's like Conan. I never had sympathy for Conan when he lost Tonight Show because NBC warned, them, warned him for a long time, you're not, doing the, you're not playing ball with us. And he was like, I'm an artist. Boom, you're out. And, and that, that may have happened here. It may not. We don't know. We're not in those meetings. But I'm not worried because I, I, we'll talk about director choices, but I think you bring a veteran pinch hitter. It might be Kazan, Silverado, Big Chill, whatever. This is not the time we're going to talk more about going out and getting something new or Jamie Jones. Roka can direct it. Um, so <laughs> sure, I, mean. uh, I, I take it as a good thing. I'd, I'd rather have them correct it like they maybe it did with Rogue One. We're like, hey, there's some things we need fixing. Let's bring in Gilroy. Let's reshoot some of these things and get it right in our eyes. Uh, I'd rather have them stop right now and go, hey, this isn't working. Both sides, both sides. They might go direct Flash or another Lego movie and they'll be fine. Um, and, and we'll get it right. Yeah, and as a fan, I want them to get it right. The reason why I panic a little bit more than you is because this is not like, oh, we had meetings about how we're going to shoot the movie and we decided we don't see eye to eye. They've been shooting this thing for months now. And they Absolutely. have all this footage of this apparent comedic tone that they didn't think was right for the character. So yep. how And they have reshoots that are planned for later this summer that were going to happen regardless mm-hmm. of what Lord and Miller did with the principal photography. But still, like, how do you get this far down the road? I hope they left a trail of breadcrumbs, Roka, because this is a tough woods to get out of a lot. Yeah, well, I mean, what you read in the Variety Report is they go as, as far as to say, like, Kathleen Kennedy didn't like the way they folded their socks. That's an actual quote from that. So how deep did this go? And right. was this a situation? How did this not come up in the pre-production meetings, in the initial pitch meetings between Lord and Miller and Kathleen Kennedy and Lucasfilm? This is what I'm concerned about. Is this a bad relationship where you start out and both of you are on like showing your best sides of yourself at the beginning, the first few dates, and then eventually as it goes along, you start to see the uglier sides of each other, and you see that you don't actually have things in common that you thought you did, and you get to that point where the main character, Han Solo, you have legitimate differences on how to approach it. And what concerns me here, Ken and Mark, which you guys brought about Lawrence Kasdan, look, I get it. Kasdan created the character. But let's not, let's talk about the other elephant in the room, and that is Kasdan is in his 60s. These guys are younger. They have their finger on the pulse of what this generation or the ne- or the generation uh, behind us wants to see. Maybe they want to see a different kind of solo, a solo from that time in his 20s, in his th- early 30s. That's the solo. That is not the solo you want to see that you see at, in the 50s or later in Force Awakens. So maybe there is a legitimate difference in their approach to solo, wanting to make him a little more relatable than just like safe, which is what probably Kasdan and Kathleen Kennedy and Disney wants to do, and there's nothing wrong with that. They're doing the Rogue One kicked ass, Force Awakens kicked ass. They've got the formula that works, 
and maybe they weren't ready to push the boundaries with a character this important. And so it can, this is what concerns me is, is this an, a generation gap situation? Uh, and because it has a lot of shades of like what happened with Josh Trank and then they got rid of him, they hired him and they got rid of him. The Trevor O thing I think is going to come up now, eventually at some point, because they're not starting production until next year. And also there's a little bit of the, and I want to say this correctly, the uh, Zack Snyder, Joss Whedon situation in that someone is walking into a situation where a film is already precast, is already mostly shot, and they're taking it over, whether it's Ron Howard or Kasdan, and I hope it's, or Joe John, I hope it's none of those guys. I hope they find someone that is in the same age range as Lord and Miller to take over the film and do something well with it. But it concerns me that this is that kind of situation because you're going into a film that you didn't cast and you're trying to bring something out of this thing that will make sense. Yeah, you know? the generation so it gap, it, it's an interesting point mm. you bring up, and Jeremy, I'll ask you, do you think that the sky is falling here, or do you think we have this whole situation rectified in less than 12 parsecs? I don't think the sky is falling. I think the Han Solo movie might be fucked, but I don't think the sky <laughs> is falling. You know, like, I, I think we'll all live to, live to see another Star Wars day, but... It is a bummer about the generation gap you were talking yeah. about because I feel like The Force Awakens, it had its one job was to bridge the gap with the prequel fans and the OG Star Wars fans and bring them together. And to think, and you, you might be absolutely right in a world where we're just speculating we weren't there right, in the right. rooms, it might still be there. And so, I mean, the, the thing is the Han Solo movie takes place in a time where Han Solo was relatively the same age he was in the original Star Wars movie. Right. So you definitely have a template there. So at a point, I... I was excited for a Star Wars, uh, a Han Solo movie, and then I started to get really apprehensive about it. Like, do I really want to see this guy? Do I really want to see all the answers? You know, the fun of Han Solo is you see this, this, this nerf herder, this space pirate, that you get to project what you love about him onto him. You know, that's what a supporting character is great for. And then I feel like that's, again, speculation. I feel like that's the problem, is that you have all these other entities going, no, this is Han Solo. Oh, no, 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 that's Han Solo. No, you're wrong. That's Han Solo. And they're trying to make Han Solo how they saw Han Solo. And it just conflicts. And that just shows me why I, I don't want to see a Han Solo movie. So I get it. The director who should replace it, or should replace them as the director of the Han Solo movie as a dog with a barrel of ale around his neck. That'll fix everything. <laughs> Done. It could be. And, and you know what? You, you, you segue us to our next point here is that Deadline is now reporting that the front runner to helm the remainder of the Han Solo movie is none other than train conductor John Roca. No, it's not Roca. I read that wrong. Wouldn't it that is awesome? Ron Howard. So if you hear that Ron Howard is going to be the guy, Jeremy, do you think that that bodes well for the project in the rest of its, uh, uh, you know, going forward. Yeah, I think a 90s Ron Howard would be great. Now Ron <laughs> Howard, not as much, because yeah. I haven't loved a Ron Howard movie You just in, want to CGI Ron Howard back to where he's in his early 90s. <laughs> That's right, man. Let's just do it. Richie, Ransom all the way. I'm Richie all 13. Uh, I, uh, I believe he made a movie, Ru like, oh, Rush. I liked Rush. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, I'm like, maybe it's an older property that he will love and then uh, take on. I don't know. It's a... Uh, I can't help but see Fan Forstick in this, and mm -hmm. it scares me. I don't want Fan Forstick and Han Solo to be synonymous with the comparisons. I don't want that. Kenny Richie Cunningham possibly helming the rest of the Han Solo movie. Or the narrator for Rest of Development. I'm okay with it. Again, I go to what I said, at, 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 and I, John, you said a lot of great points of the generation gap, all the kind of things, and then making a, a Han Solo movie for now. But if you're Lucasfilm, you want to get someone in. This is not the time to make a big splashy young announce uh, direct announcement of a young director or someone new and uh, or changing the cultural discussion on directors. This isn't the time. If it's your business, you want to bring in someone you're comfortable with. I'm sure Kathleen Kennedy and Ron Howard are comfortable. Uh, uh, Joe Johnston involved with Star Wars. Larry Kasdan obviously involves the Star Wars. You got want to bring in someone to write the ship. It's an interim head coach. It's a weird situation. Talking sports. You like the sports. I like the sports. We all like the sports. You bring in someone from the inside. The general manager comes down and, and takes the team the rest of the season. You figure it out the next one. And I think that's what they do. So Ron Howard or not, I'm okay with this kind of safe pick. Yeah, Roka, I mean, it's something you and I were talking about before we went live is that you hate a situation where a coach gets fired late in the season yeah. and then you bring in somebody new because that new coach generally does not get the chance to shine like they properly should mm -hmm. if they're actually auditioning for a future job. So it makes me nervous, the prospect of Lucasfilm bringing in somebody who is younger or hasn't been tested as much. Yeah. I want those people to get all the opportunities in the world, but I think you're being handcuffed if you get brought in to a Han Solo project from the outside. So I would vote for somebody like a Kazdan, or if Ron Howard is already in talks with Kathleen Kennedy and he has carnal knowledge of this project already, then I would, I would not hate that pick.
pick. Not only are you going with the name, but you're also going with somebody who you feel is a steady hand who can write this ship, even though the write the ship movie in the heart of the sea mm. wasn't all that well received. Oh, yeah, and that's... Okay, so here's the thing, and I think you both are right in a way that he's the right guy to bring in. He's a veteran director. He can steer it. Uh, to, he can steer the ship back home to port. The thing is that, and it also makes sense for Kathleen Kennedy because, okay, he's not going to cause problems. He's not going to ruffle feathers. He understands how the studio system works, so he will be able to take the, the ship there. But my concern is then we'll get another safe Han Solo film, and what was the point of making a Han Solo film That's if it point. wasn't to break convention, if it wasn't to show us something different, if it wasn't to show us some... If I'm just seeing a person doing a cosplay of Harrison Ford as Han Solo for uh, two hours, I'm not going to be interested in that. And Jeremy, you bring up a great point that a lot of people pushed back against this idea of a Han Solo film from the beginning, and this gives them even more ammunition mm -hmm. to be like, see, they shouldn't have even started doing one of these films because what's great about Han Solo is the unknown about him. We can put our ideas of what he was before into that into that empty vessel and decide for ourselves what his backstory is and what we like and comfortable with. And if we if you bring someone like Ron Howard is, he's going to do a nice job. He's going to be fine. Initially, I pushed back against it because I thought, once again, generation gap. But in this situation, you guys are right. You want a steady hand to take you home. It, and I think it makes sense. Let's say we fire Mark Ellis right now and we got a half hour left on the show. We're going to have Dennis come in and host it. Tomorrow, yeah. we bring in Cody Hall <laughs> and we start something new. Cody, Cody Hall, we want that fresh, risky take <laughs> yeah. on Collider Movie. Time. That man has never looked more pumped <laughs> <laughs> genuinely lit up and I'm all you guys is, look, look I, I know a lot of you guys are huge star wars fans even if you don't care about the han solo movie that much you still want star wars to succeed if you don't if you've ever seen a star wars movie here's some fun facts from the world of history so this is obviously not the first time that a director has been on a project been shooting for a long time and then been jettisoned only to bring in somebody new at the last second there's a few movies that came out in the 1930s that did that they were called the wizard of oz and gone with the wind they ended up okay more recently there's a project called Waterworld that Kevin Reynolds shot and had completed and then Kevin Costner didn't like the cut of the movie he was making so boom he's out Kevin Costner comes mm -hmm. in and finishes post-production I think the most relevant example to this story is Superman 2 where Richard Donner had shot about 75 percent of that movie and it wasn't just that they didn't like the direction he was going yes the, the studio wanted a lighter tone with Superman 2 but they also ran into some budgetary concerns so they brought in Richard Lester director of Hard Day's Night. Hard Day's Come night. in and finish the movie, and now we have, oh, which cut of Superman 2 do you like better? I think either way, that movie ended up all right. So if we can get an all right Han Solo movie, it's not ideal, but it's something. No, I... I we do have to address the fact that, you know, Waterworld was shit, right? <laughs> I, I thought you were going to use the example of Tombstone, but okay. Oh, jeez. I could use the example of Bad Girls, which also kicked their director out and brought in somebody new. So <laughs> this is not the first time it happened. Hopefully this is the shining example of how you can have a replacement come in, knock it out of the park, and we can all live to see another day <laughs> and another Star Wars standalone movie. Ye you want to watch my copy of Bad Girls with me later? <laughs> Ashley, what's our next story? <laughs> Coming from a report in Variety, three-time Oscar winner Daniel Day-Lewis is retiring from acting. The six-year-old star, best known for playing Lincoln in Steven Spielberg's Oscar-winning biopic, Bill the Butcher in Scorsese's Gangs of New York, and Daniel Plainview in Paul Thomas Anderson's There Will Be Blood, has one final film awaiting release, an untitled drama set in the world of high fashion. That movie is scheduled to hit theaters on December 20th, 5th, 2017, reuniting him with director Anderson. Day-Lewis did not give a reason for his retirement, but he has <laughs> chronic back pain problems. So that could be it. And a statement released by his spokeswoman did confirm the news saying, this is a private decision and neither he nor his representatives will make any further comment on this subject. Ken, what do you think about Daniel Day-Lewis retiring from that? I think Christian Harloff is an eight-year-old <laughs> <laughs> who likes playing games. <laughs> he should be punished. You're uh, talking about cargo shorts. He's a bored dad at an amusement park with a fanny pack full of goodies. <laughs> yeah, he is. The Jedi Council this week will be interesting. Um, tip of a cap to Daniel Day-Lewis, if this is true and it holds true, if he's not just researching a role as a retiree. Um, <laughs> there's a good chance that's the case. Uh, you know, I love it. And we don't know, again, we don't know the reasons there was been, there, you know, Typical Daniel Day Lewis. He's probably he'll you will never see him again. He'll never need to explain. He's gonna go open up like a cobbler store and a, or a musket shooting range in in New England. We'll never see him again, and that's fine. Uh, the examples I go to uh, are Barry Sanders 
and oddly enough, CM Punk. If if you want to walk away from something, it's your job, it's your decision, and I respect that as a fan. Uh, I don't need Barry Sanders to play for the Cleveland Browns for three other years. I don't need CM Punk to stumble through wrestling matches if he doesn't want to. And I don't want Daniel Day-Lewis to do anything he doesn't want to do either. I tip the cap. What a career. Last Mohicans to talk about Madeline Stowe, one of my all-time favorite movies. Stay alive! <laughs> I will find you! Yeah. Great mom. I, it's, the Barry Sanders comparison is... I, I tweeted a picture of Brett Favre yesterday just trying to get some yucks, but the Barry Sanders one is a lot more of a comparable situation because Daniel Day-Lewis, I take him at his word more so than most artists. Now, I'm not saying I totally believe right. the retirement news, but he has never been a fame or he's never been somebody who wants to be out there in the public eye. He wants to make his movies. He might grab a statue at the end of the, the whole trip and then go back and cobble <laughs> shoes until it's time to work again. And if he doesn't feel like doing that anymore, then I give him all the credibility in the world for the incredible body of work that he has to this point. I don't totally buy it simply because I've been around too many artists. I've seen so many comics have a bad set and then quit stand-up comedy, and then they show up at the comedy store the next night. Like, ah, I rethought some things. It's not going to happen overnight with Daniel Day-Lewis, but maybe he takes a few years off. Maybe he takes five or ten years off. I think you're going to see Daniel Day-Lewis back in a movie again. But something that we brought up earlier this week on the show is the retirements of people like Gene Hackman and Sean Connery, where you're like, ah, you guys aren't really retired. They've stayed retired. They're a lot older than Daniel Day-Lewis currently is, but I could see the three of them living in a flat together in New York and having a pretty good time talking about the old days, Jeremy. <laughs> I would, that would be the greatest flat ever. I would hope that they're my neighbors. You know, I'd be like, party as hard as you want to. Uh, I, I'm with you. Like, you're, you're, you're not that good at something as Daniel Day-Lewis is in acting and just walk away from it forever. You know, I have to feel like it's in your blood. You're, it's more than a job. You're driven to do it. So it really is like a painter just going, oh, no, sorry, you, you, I'm not painting anymore. It's like that'll last for a bit, uh, and then you'll come back to it, I imagine. But again, I mean, if we're going to the Zack Snyder thing, it was a hard lesson for everyone where we were like, Oh, they're not just people you see on the news. We, we idolize them, we worship them, but they're human beings with human being problems. And all we know is that for personal reasons, he said, I am done with acting. Don't know what it means, but it could have been a big thing in his world. Um, all the best of luck to him. If it is uh, some bad thing that he's dealing with, I hope he deals with it. I hope he's all right. And I hope to see him back. But whatever he does in life, I hope he does it for him. Roka, should Double D. Lewis be the next director of the Han Solo movie? <laughs> no, no, no. I think we should let him be. Listen, there's a thing about me as, as an actor. Daniel Day-Lewis has been one of these people that you go see no matter what the movie is. And even in bad movies, he is always fantastic. In Nine, in something like The Boxer, which isn't the, quite that great, he's fantastic in it. Uh, the Ballad of Jack and Rose, The Crucible, Gangs of New York. These aren't always, in my opinion, the greatest films but he always brings it as an actor. And, it, and if I've read just about every interview that he's ever done, every profile on him, and they always talk about how much acting takes out of him. Jeremy makes a great point. He's really good at this. The reason he's really good at this is because it takes his entire soul to do what he's doing. When he, when he uh, finished The Boxer, he quit acting. He, he said, I'm, I'm done. And it took Scorsese to coax him out after five years to come back and do Gangs of New York. And he was making shoes in Italy. This is the kind of man that we're dealing with. We cannot put normal understanding or constraints on a guy like this because he is truly an artist in that way that he gives himself completely to the parts he plays. So therefore, to ask him at 60 years old to keep giving this much, maybe he's hit that point where he can't. He's married to Arthur Miller's daughter, his beautiful wife. They have two beautiful children. Maybe he just is like, look, I've won three Best Actor Oscars. No one else has ever done this. I leave a great legacy in film. If I leave now, I leave on top, and no one after has to say I lost a step or I got too old that I couldn't quite bring it anymore. And Im imagine how much that takes out of him, you know, to ask him to keep doing it. Maybe he hit that point where he's like, I know my body, I know myself. Like any athlete, it's time to retire. I was moved by his performance in Lincoln and Gangs of New York, yeah. but I agree with Ken. My favorite Daniel Day-Lewis movie of all time is Last of the Mohicans. Yeah. If you are hanging up, or if you're not hanging up and you come back next month, sir, we drink your milkshake. All right, let's move on to <laughs> buy or sell. This is the part of the show where Ashley's going to give us a topic. Maybe she'll giggle during it. We'll find out. <laughs> and we simply say whether we buy it or sell it. Wonder Woman is already the best-reviewed film of the DC Extended Universe thus far and soon may become its highest grosser as well. With the film opening to a record $103 million, talk quickly turned to a sequel where it was soon after revealed that director Patty Jenkins hadn't yet signed on for part two. 
<laughs> Hell yeah, that shit is dope. That may be about to change. In a recent interview with Variety, DC Films co-head Jeff Johns <laughs> revealed that he and Jenkins are already hard at work on writing Wonder Woman 2. Patty and I are writing the treatment right now. The goal is to make another great Wonder Woman film. I had a blast making it with Patty the first time. We've got a cool idea for the second one. Roca by herself, Jeff Johns, writing Wonder Woman 2 with Patty Jenkins. Oh, I absolutely buy this. I mean, Jeff Johns, was, from what we're hearing, Jeff Johns, when he took over, kind of changed the direction of the DCEU and where it's going from what Snyder and the previous regime had done. We see this now with Wonder Woman. So why shouldn't he write? And of course, he's got extensive history of writing in comics, understanding the characters, knowing all the characters involved and the superheroes and the villains involved. His stuff on Green Lantern, Rebirth, Batman Earth 1, that 52 story he did with Booster Gold, trying to maintain everyone's storyline so nothing happens. The stuff with Green Lantern, Blackest Night, all the Hawkman stuff, JSA. Jeff Johns is steeped in the comic book lore of DC Comics, so it makes absolute sense for him to write this. And from what we're hearing is that they're going to go jumping further in time from where they left off, but not modern, I'm not where I left off, but where we finished with the World War I storyline, but not all the way modern. So I w I'm happy that he's going to take over uh, this situation and writing with Patty Jenkins and then also put it in a time frame that we can like kind of enjoy seeing Wonder Woman play around. And maybe even before Superman or Batman shows up, so she, it's still another singular movie of Wonder Woman, which she showed Gal Gadot that she could carry this thing completely all the way to fruition and have the audiences love it and enjoy it. And I love this quote uh, from John Burke who said, you would be silly not to analyze how a movie was received. We're talking about the lessons from Batman vs. Superman. On Suicide Squad, also, the movie did incredibly well commercially. It didn't work narratively. You had some great casting and some great characterizations, but where the story fell down was on narrative, on plot. We could do better. That's the thing. We could do better. I think Johns feels like he can, and this is the right situation with Patty Jenkins, and pretty much the sure that she's coming back, just the way he's talking about interviews. So for me, I absolutely buy this. Yeah, it's a huge buy for me. I mean, the first step to getting Patty Jenkins to direct Wonder Woman 2 is having her be intimately involved in the creative process of the movie, because if she's the driving force of this, and she has a resource like Jeb Johns to refer to if you're talking about the lore of Wonder Woman and how it regards to, to the DC universe, but also the current DCU of movies, this is a slam dunk for me, Ken. Getting Patty Jenkins involved in any capacity is good news with Wonder Woman 2, and hopefully it ends with her actually directing it. Now, John's stopped short of confirming that in this initial statement, but it seems like we're heading that way. Absolutely, and as it should, I don't think that's surprised anyone. It was just a matter of coming together on terms mm -hmm. and, and getting her involved. I love John. Great points. Great points, John. Points for Roca today on this one. Oh. About the change and how they did have to kind of look. They, they could be proud of what they made, and you as a fan can like Batman versus Superman. You can like Man of Steel. You can like a Suicide Squad. Uh, Christian loved it. Uh, you, you can uh, love all that stuff. But they knew there was something that had to change, and sometimes change is good. Sometimes the things you're used to uh, weren't bad, but the new things will be even better, and you have to be open to it. It seems like they were, and they're working together towards that. Uh, this is a this is a great pairing, Patty Jenkins. It's her world right now. I think we all should live with it, live in it, and and I'm excited that uh, they're coming together and working on this. Buy or sell, Kid Dynamite. Uh, I'll buy, and I love the fact that every time you said Johns, I was like, yes, and <laughs> <laughs> it just confused the hell he, out of me. Jeremy right. Johns has not said whether Patty Jenkins will officially direct Wonder Woman too. Uh, I. <clears throat> I think you have the uh, the titan of the current DC cinematic universe in one hand, titan of the uh, DC comic book universe in the other. Uh, together, they might be able to make some magic. I think it takes a strong person or entity of people to be like, you know, we like what we did, but... Uh, you're right. They had flaws. So saying you guys were right, sorry, it, that, that's just that's a, an element of strength you don't mm -hmm. often see in this uh, this um, social media world. So I think <laughs> it's great that they did that, and I uh, can't wait to see Wonder Woman too. All right, in our next story, Ashley, a funny guy is trying to do something scary. That what? he is. Though Paul Feig is best known for his comedic moves starring some of the most powerful female comedians in the business, thanks to a report from the tracking board, we're going to get something very different from the director for his next project. The outlet reports that Feig has signed on to direct a thriller, A Simple Favor, with Anna Kendrick and Blake Lively in Talks to Star. In a simple favor, a single mother's life is turned upside down when her best friend vanishes. Harper Collins first published the book by the same name and described it as being in the vein of Girl on the, Gone Girl and Girl on the Train. Should Kendrick and Lively's deals close, production would start in August. However, no release date has been determined. Jeremy Byersell, Paul Feig directing a thriller with Anna Kendrick and Blake Lively. 
Uh, I buy it. You had me at Gone Girl. You kind of lost me at Girl on the Train, but I, uh, <laughs> I, I think that I, it's always great to see a director kind of flex his muscles. Like I'm known for comedy, but I want to do something else. It's like when Zach Braff was like, "I'm going to direct Garden State." You're like, "What?" And then you watch Garden State. You're like, "Ah, you got directing chops." I think that's great. So I want to see, I want to see him branch out, do other stuff. Uh, Blake Lively is one of those people where it's like. They were shoving her down everyone's throat like she's going to be the next big thing. But if she's really given a chance, she does have talent. So I want to see what they I want to see what they do together. So, yeah, find it. This is a big buy for me because Paul Feig, yes, he's known for comedy, but somebody else who was known primarily for comedy was Jordan Peele, and then he crushed a thriller earlier this year with Get Out. So I'm not going to say this movie is going to be the next Get Out, whether it's in from an entertainment or a cultural perspective, but this sounds like something intriguing, and I love it when people who are known for one thing try to go into another genre because, Candace, you know better than anybody, comedy is all about timing. So are yes. thrillers. Is <laughs> <laughs> you buy yourself there. Um, I absolutely buy it. A nice, funny guy trying to do something scary sounds like me and John Rokin when we go on dates with women. Hey. It's, it's, uh, it's a, it's a, it can work out sometimes. Now, I buy it because Paul Feig deserves it. Uh, I buy this, I sell Ackroyd's vodka. All right. Uh, this guy, he oh, has God. put his money where it's, his mouth is in, in terms of trying to, to back female led projects. He's not backed off on that. This sounds like something great, and I think we should follow him on this adventure. Bye, bye, bye. That's why, Roka, I consider Bridesmaids and the Heat to be monstrous victories. Yep. and I think that Spy and Ghostbusters are wins. <laughs> what do you think about this next one? Okay, so here's what I'll say. Uh, this makes the most sense for him at this stage. After the Ghostbusters debacle, and it, what it, not, whether you like the movie or not, all the crap around it is a lot for a director to take on, especially someone like Paul Fake, who has shown incredible love for her, his actresses and for the projects he's, he commits to. So this is a nice change of pace. Go do something else. Seems like a smaller film. Great. Cast someone like Anna Kendrick, who's fantastic, can play serious, can play comedy. She's great end of watch. She's great in, in Up in the Air. She has her little oh, yeah. moments of drama and little moments of comedy. And Blake Lively, Jeremy is right. I like The Shallows. I thought, and I went in thinking... This is Blake Lively, and I enjoyed her absolutely in that film. It surprised me. So yeah, with the right material, she can actually step up to the plate with the right director. I think Paul Feig is the right director for something like this. And of course, if you talk about Gone Girl, that vein, once again, smaller film, based on a novel, see what it can do, see where you can go, and it's a nice change of pace. No one's going to be like, oh, you're ruining my childhood, Paul Feig. No, he's not going to have to deal with any of that crap. He's just going to be like, I'm just going to focus on making a nice film. And you're right, Jordan Peele, that's a great point. Make that change. See if you are that capable as a director. You've obviously conquered comedy, and I will. Put, I absolutely love Spy, so I'll put that in the in the, in the in the pile there. So go go and see what you can do with this, and I look forward to it. I, I always love when directors branch out and try other genres and see what they can do. Well, let's branch out and do one more buy or sell. What's up? There is a new trailer for Annabelle Creation. It hit online yesterday. The fourth movie released in the Conjuring universe is a spin-off of the original movie with two more movies in development to follow, The Nun and The Crooked Man, with both entities introduced in the second Conjuring movie. With Annabelle Creation, Lights Out director David F. Sandberg steps into direct from a screenplay by original Annabelle writer Gary Doberman. The movie is set to hit theaters on August 11th. Mark Byersell, the new trailer for Annabelle Creation. Well, the good news for Annabelle Creation is that you're getting at least one buy on this panel. I don't know how the other three gents <laughs> feel about it, but I enjoyed the trailer for what it was. I got some good scares out of it. It looks like this is a step in the right direction for the Annabelle franchise. Now, do I need to see another Annabelle movie after this? Probably not, but I'm looking forward to this movie. I think David Sandberg has shown me enough in his previous works, the Lights Out full movie, the Lights Out the short movie, that I want to see what he can do when you add a scary doll to the mix. This does not look like it's winning any Oscars, but it looks like it's going to get me into a theater, shove a lot of popcorn in my face, and get really scared. Roka, you yeah. buying with me? Uh, I am buying with you. Yeah. If I look at a horror trailer and I go, nope, that means uh, it's a good trailer. It's going to be a fantastic <laughs> film. That's the way it goes for me. I'm horror. I am so scared to go into theaters and experience this. But when they're really good, they drag me in there. And this looks like it's going to be fantastic with the right amount of scares. What people are saying, though, online worries me that some of the scares are in the trailer. So you're getting spoiled for the movie, mm -hmm. which bothers me. So that concerns me about the trailer. But I still buy it. It definitely scares me enough to get me in the theater. And I'm a massive fan of Shazam, Captain Marvel, Billy Batson as a character. I will stump and fight and die on the hill for Shazam 
in the Justice League. So for me, I will see anything Sandberg does just to see what he's going to do with the Shazam film. So I support it. From I actually buy it. Scouting report perspective, you're yeah. going to see Anvil Creation. Absolutely. Jeremy, you're coming with us. I just love the fact that Christian stopped fucking with the show notes when it came down to the real issues like <laughs> Annabelle creation, not Daniel Day-Lewis leaving for unknown reasons. So, uh, yeah, I, uh, I also props to another Shazam fan because I love Shazam, too. Uh, I, yeah, I buy this. I buy this trailer also. I'm with you guys on it. You know, the first Annabelle was an abomination. It was horrible. I didn't like it. And then it's, we again, Ouija 2 kind of got me into it. Wait, you can you go back and make a, a good sequel to, to a horrible uh, horror movie? And then there's some buzz. It's like, nope, the movie's actually not so bad. Yeah. It's actually quite enjoyable. There was a scare in there where you're so convinced in the trailer, you're like, oh, it's coming from the side, and then the monster comes from the top. That was actually <laughs> really cool because it was kind of a rope-a-dope. Again, like you just said, now I now know that for when yeah. I'm watching the movie, so that is a bummer, but I thought the trailer was really effective. I buy it. Ken, you don't like the scary movies. Oh, boy. Where'd he go? Where, oh, boy. Nope. Okay. Ken is, Ken is hiding, and he's saying he is not buying the Annabelle Creation okay. trailer. Thank you for your input, <laughs> Ken. And now we are going to let you guys know that at the end of this show, we're going to save some time for your live Twitter questions. So go ahead and start tweeting us right now at Collider Video. And I want to remind you guys, Movie Talk is not the only show on Collider Video's massive YouTube channel. Right now, you guys can check out the episode of Heroes that went up yesterday, hosted by John Schnapp, as well as the latest movie trivia showdown. That would be the Team League. The fans late to the party going up against Team Action. Check that out right now. There's also a couple of reviews. We just talked about Annabelle Creation. We already have... A super early review of that movie up on the channel right now, as well as the just dropped Transformers The Last Night film. And you guys can actually go to the description in this vid and you can check out the playlist for Jeremy Johnson's show, Awesome Tacular. Woo. Download the Go90 app right now on your phone so you can watch new episodes and see if we double fist, if we throw balls into cups, or if we get the proverbial pie to the face. Now we go to Mailbag. This is the part of the show where you guys send us in your questions. You guys can email us anytime. Video at gmail.com. We'll answer it either here on Movie Talk or on the weekend show's mailbag. So, Ashley, what's in our mailbox today? Damon writes, hello, Collider team. I was reading that The Mummy could lose up to $95 million in overall box office. Is that difficult to come back from? Do you think The Mummy would have done better opening in late summer, like an August time frame or even October before Halloween, versus an early June summer release going up against movies like WW and T5? August is... Yeah, that's not the question. <laughs> Damon, uh, I like your thought process, Damon, because I think the release date of a movie, particularly a movie that purports to be in the horror vein and wants to open up this dark universe, release date means everything. I felt like the Star Trek Beyond box office was severely hampered by the fact that they opened in the summertime when they did. I think Star Trek Beyond could have opened in February, March, and crushed it at the box office. And I think The Mummy would have done better if it opened around Halloween because... The Mummy itself is as much of an action-adventure movie that uh, attempts comedy uh, than it is a horror movie. There's horror elements in there for sure, but it's a lot like the adventure films that Brendan Fraser was in. So it might not make the most sense for a scary movie, but if you open it up around Halloween and you just tweak that tone a little bit and make us more feel like we're in a dark universe and not just zany action universe, I think The Mummy would have done a lot better. So it's as much tone as release date for me, Jeremy, how about it for you? Well, that's the funny thing about that is how do you tweak the tone in a movie that's completed? Enter the argument for Han Solo. You know, mm. if the if the you tone hire is Ron Howard, <laughs> right, if the tone's wrong, how do you how do you go back and change that? I feel like releasing it around Halloween would have been a bit of a bait and switch, where it's like, oh, it's scary. It's like that's. It's more sci-fi action with some comedy attempts than scary. So why it came out on Halloween, I have no idea. Um, August may or may not have helped it. I feel like if it came out in, say, the overseas markets first, because it crushed overseas, yeah. and then everyone over there is like, oh, yeah. And so when it, by the time it gets over here, then everyone's like, hey, they said is it, so that you may have made a, a bit more if you just kind of switched the release location rather than the date. Um, in terms of the date, it, it is when you're in the beginning of the summer, you are going up against some titans and some monsters and your movie is hot one week gone the next unless you're wonder woman apparently so uh I, I feel like august may have been a better one but i don't think that would have helped it just would have put it in its 
proper place in a summer movie release, which would would have been it's an August movie. Roka, we need to find ninety five million dollars. Yeah, how do we do it? Uh, I don't think you can find it for this movie. I don't care when you release it. To be honest with you, I think this is all about quality. I think the film would have kicked ass if it was a good film, no matter when you released it. But unfortunately, it falls off into the first twenty minutes, and it just falls right off the cliff, and it does not deliver what it was supposed to deliver. And I don't know how you world built, universe built on a film that's ninety minutes long. That makes no sense to me. <sighs> you know, you're laying the groundwork. You introduce characters that are. Uh, out of nowhere, with no gr- with no uh, uh, no complexity, no extra stuff behind them that gives you no idea why they're showing up at this time. Okay, Transformers, I get it. Let's move that out of the equation. <laughs> but like, wait, that's I don't expect anything from this. But with Dark Universe, you're building these characters that are like beloved in lore by all by people who love books, by people who love movies. So you're crossing two medias. So you've got a responsibility here. And to me, it doesn't matter where they released it. It's one of those. There are films that get released at bad times and they get screwed over. Like Out of Sight got screwed over because of its release date too. That's a fantastic film that not a lot of people found. So for me, I think this. It wouldn't have mattered when you released it. You wouldn't have found 95 million. But I think Jeremy's logic makes sense. If you know this film is tracking better overseas, start overseas. Some of the Star Wars films have been released a day or two before they come domestically it makes sense do it two or three weeks ahead of time then come back here you build up the buzz more people will come and you'll at least trick them to spend their money <laughs> and then afterwards be like oh it's a crap movie from word of mouth oh I would be a shark movie exec I'd studio exec <laughs> tell that, like, ah, let's trick him into money was the movie really 90 minutes long it's about 90 minutes long it it felt longer right so that's not that's that's something yeah Ken when do we release the mummy to quote Gandalf, <laughs> all you have to decide is when you want to hear Tom, Scro- Tom Cruise scream on a plane. And I don't know if there's the right time. I don't know if there's the right time. For Which this. appendix was that in? It's in the, it's in the, the fourth one, the, the unreleased one with the pictures. Um, I don't know if that would have... October? Who goes out and sees movies in October? You're out trick-or-treating. Right. I know Jeremy is. So I, I don't know if it, yeah. tone might have been a little better. Overseas first might have been a little better. I don't know if it's a release date. Great question, Damon. Well thought out question. Uh, I just don't know. They, they scientifically research those in a laboratory about release dates. <laughs> and maybe that's the problem. Maybe just throw a movie out there in VHS and see what happens. But I don't know if October would have saved it versus another time. You know where the mummy can make up that $95 million? It's just more people riding that mummy ride at Universal Studios because that thing is it's a good. trip. It's it the good, best 32 seconds of my life. It is <laughs> amazing. It's a little short. It's, it's a little, little short. It's, it's, it's a, little a tight, short. concise ride. But man, it is fun. So is a Transformers ride. I wish the movies were that good. All right, let's move on to live Twitter questions. Guess what, kiddies? We have over 6,000 of you watching us live right now. We have no idea what question's going to hit us. So, Wendy, shock me. All right, this first one uh, talks about the, your thoughts on the Black Panther trailer being viewed 89 million times or 89 million views in the first 24 hours. I think it's a huge win. And we see trailers break YouTube records or get close to the all-time YouTube number all the time within a day. And I'm glad that Black Panther can be mentioned up there because, yes, we're very excited about its involvement in the MCU. But this movie is going to be such a cultural touchstone and so socially and politically significant going forward that on top of the entertainment value we're going to get, this is a trailer that should be watched. And just the baseline is that That trailer kicks ass. It's a perfect teaser because it doesn't give away anything. We barely get to see anything of Black Panther. We get introduced to a lot of characters, and we say, oh, who's that? I want to know more about that person. It's one of the better teasers I've ever seen in my entire life, and I'm probably responsible for about a million and a half of those views. How about you, Jeremy? (laughs) I love the trailer myself. It's always great to see enthusiasm, you know, the next trailer that gets that much. Black Panther had the talent behind it. We knew that. But then you see the visuals of the movie. You're like, oh, visually speaking, Mm. it looks great. You know, conceptually speaking, it looks great. I hope they touch on the politics of running a a country and being a superhero. There's a lot I want to see about this movie. I hope they all deliver. But right now for the trailer, great trailer. Ken Napsack. Great trailer. Well earned with its uh, views and accolades. Um, I'm happy for it. And that's really all I got to say. John Roca. Yeah, I talked about this with Jay Washington on my Outlaw Nation podcast on the SK Plus podcast channel. We talked about (laughs) it. Bing, bing, bing. No, listen, this is great. I think this is fantastic, right? This is an African movie set in Africa about a superhero. And nobody cares because we shouldn't care. It's quality that matters, and the trailer is quality, and that's why it's viewed that much. People going over and over and over again to watch it because it hits all the right buttons. And here's the key. Chadwick Boseman doesn't even say a word in the whole trailer, and that's amazing to sell your superhero that he doesn't even have to speak, and he's still badass. 
Fine, I'll listen to your podcast. All right, Wendy, what's up next? <laughs> this one comes from Tyler McLaughlin, who writes, should they limit how many big-budget movies come out each year? Blockbusters often cost smaller movies to go unnoticed. The International Council of They. It's eight people in a hollowed-out volcano. I don't know that we can limit the amount of people that, that release big-budget movies. I think that uh, I'll, I'll, I'll steal a quote from Jeremy sitting right next to me, is that audiences speak with their wallets. And Jeremy says Velcro. I don't own a wallet, but <laughs> it is Velcro. You, we it's still have <laughs> cards or we have ways to pay for movies, and that's how studios know what we want to see. So if you go to pay, see smaller movies. Like, how many of you have seen Split this year and Get Out? And how many of you saved your money when you wanted to see those movies, but you're like, oh, well, I really want to see Kong Skull Island, or I really want to see Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. There's no right or wrong answer here, because I don't judge a movie based on how much money it costs. I just base it on quality. If I was entertained during the film-going experience, and there is something to be said for experiencing a certain kind of movie in a theater setting versus something that you can appreciate just as much on a home viewing. So I don't think you're ever going to get a limit to it, but it's up to you, the audience, to say, hey, this is what I want to spend my money on. When I go out to a movie, I care about quality over budgetary concerns. Jeremy, what kind of wallet do you have? You know, it's really funny. It's the one thing I took away from all of that. It's like my first phrase needs to be like, I actually don't have a Velcro wallet. <laughs> I, uh, now we all know that, but you're completely right. You speak with your wallet. That's what it is. All right, so a lot of people out there, except one person at this table, says the Transformers movies are not great. Now's your time. Now's your time to prove to Roca. How dare you? How <laughs> to dare you, prove sir? To John Roca that s sanity has not left the world entirely. It's up to you. You have the power. Roka, you don't have a Velcro wallet. You still no. have a chain wallet. That's right. He's a badass. <laughs> a badass. Seattle no, loves you, Roka. Right. Seattle loves you. I got, I got the you. button and the flip open of the whole leather thing with the chain. No, listen, you're never going to stop. No matter how you, there's not enough people to like not give enough money to certain blockbusters. Ever since the 70s, this is how studios operate. Doesn't matter who's in control, who's in charge. This is how it works. They're always looking for the tentpole franchise, even more so over the last two decades. They're looking for the tentpole franchise all the time. So they're always going to put extra money, a lot of money, into these big budget films. So no matter whether you go or not, for example, we just talked about The Mummy, they're still going forward with the Dark Universe. Irrelevant, because they're going to find some reason to do it, right? We spoke about Annabelle creation, or the first Annabelle wasn't that good. They're still going to go forward because they want to make that money and find a way to do it. So they're going to sink money into these big blockbusters and no matter whether you go or not there's there's always another idea that gets people excited and wants them to run to the movie theater and look go see transformers if you want to <laughs> ken i want to hear your thoughts on this but i also want to know what sort of uh, currency <laughs> consolidation contraption do you currently use i have a off-brand wallet called a nada and it uh has sweat stains on it and it's ripped and there's a gift card i don't i think it's the red lobster it's been there for like eight years i haven't pulled it out yet cheese biscuits Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, my thoughts on this are pretty simple, man. Here's they. Here's they in a room. Sir, do you want to make a movie based on a 1980s toy franchise where it'll make about $400 million for about five movies? Go picture. You want to hear what it's about? No, go picture. <laughs> That's how it's going to happen. And you're right. Dollar votes count. You know, That's the way it is. I chose to stop, stop seeing them after the first one. I don't b blame Roca for still seeing them. If he gets enjoyment out of it, gets enjoyment out of it you can't i'm a capitalist at heart you can't limit big budget stuff go see the smaller stuff you know i called my Absolutely. dad hey what'd you do this weekend saw transformers cgi's great end of conversation good glad you had a nice night dad that's what's gonna still happen that's <laughs> the business as george shapiro said uh in uh in man on the moon show business show business <laughs> i love a good man on the moon reference that is gonna do it for us here at collider movie talk i want to thank everybody here adam and cody for being behind the scenes ron howard for directing this episode <laughs> and of course my panelists up here with me ken knapsack where do the kids find you hey you can find me at ken knapsack at a big uh, game of thrones trailer did drop i'm sure i'll be tweeting about it the rest Rest of the day not working jeremy johns i don't have a mustache or sunglasses i cannot give you that tony clifton impersonation but you can find me <laughs> at jeremy johns on youtube twitter rest of the internet my show awesome tacular you can find on go 90 where ellis and i throw pies in each other's faces it's a lot of fun you'd love it roca when you're not casting spells on taurus where yes. can the kids check you out can i do that 
No, I can't do an imitation of Tony Clifton. I'm not, I, don't, I can't go that deep. That's a great movie, by the way. No, you guys can always find me at The Roca Says, R-O-C-H-A, on Twitter and on Instagram. See the shows I'm hosting, co-hosting, and getting to be a, pa- a panelist on, like this show. Of course, Outlaw Nation Podcast, as I mentioned, we have a new episode tomorrow, but if you want to listen to the previous episode, it's on the SK Plus Podcast channel and the Cinephiles, Cinedash Files on iTunes, Stitcher, and YouTube. We just did some Like It Hot, and this week we're doing Three Days of the Condor with Robert Redford. All right, Ashley Mova. Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Ashley Mova. Happy Wednesday, guys. Happy Wednesday to you, Wendy Lee. Where can everybody find you? On YouTube at the Movie Couple channel and at Wendy Lee Zaney on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. Thank you guys for spending your hump day with us, or at least a little bit of it. Have a great rest of your day. My name is merely Mark Ellis. I'll be at the Comedy Store this weekend at the Houston Improv next weekend. You can get tickets at markellislive.com. We'll see you all tomorrow. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.